All good. Uh, well, thank you very much, guys, for filling out the room. It's uh, flattering. You'd rather be uh, here than another talk or doer doing the CTF. Um, if you can read, you're already miles ahead of me. My talk is called The Terror Tracking, and it is about the uh, industry of uh, consumer spyware, or as it's recently been um, uh, tagged, uh, stalkerware. So uh, we're going to be... It's it's an industry which has been built around our kind of most private fears and like um, some people's primal urge to like control and to know all. So because um, everything kind of has to be about me, I've got my own slide at the start. So I'm Enusek Dan. Uh, I uh, I failed my OSCP and spent a lot of money doing so. So I, I like to talk about it when I can. Um, I, uh, I I work with Splunk at uh, ECS up in Edinburgh, and I'm studying software engineering at Edinburgh Napier University. Um, and I think my, uh, um, like the crossroads between software engineering and security definitely is somewhere in malware. Uh, my initial interest in security was definitely around like remote access Trojans and that kind of game of cat and mouse between, uh, malware developers and antivirus companies. So I think it's really, really cool. Uh, I'd like, and I've also, I own lots and lots of books about it, but when it comes to the technical ones, I never quite finish them because it's really hard to learn about, especially after a long days of, uh, work. So before we go any further into this, uh, does anyone not know what malware is? I wouldn't expect you to raise your hand in a form like this, but um, malware uh, is essentially just any software which is uh, specifically designed to disrupt, damage, or gain authorized access to a computer system. So although whenever we say malware, something might spring to mind like a WannaCry or like some sort of crypto locker where for, for people who don't know that, essentially uh, locks your computer, encrypts your files, and demands a ransom to, um, to get them uh, to get them back, but it can also be things like um, the Lenovo Silverfish uh, program, which came pre-installed on a couple of their laptops, which essentially just injected ads uh, into your browser. So both of those are an example of malware. It can be subversive, it can be silent, it can, like, even if you don't notice it, it's uh, still uh, uh, still malware. So um, whenever we talk about malware, they tend to be a few different uh, groups of threat actors that we tend to talk about. So First off is just the, your run-of-the-mill cyber criminal. It's their job to hack into things. It's their job to steal data from uh, unsecure systems. And it's their, it's their job to make money off of, uh, in, in the context of malware at least, it's their job to make money from malware campaigns. So um, generally, we don't have to, like as consumers and as individuals, we're not generally the target, although uh, obviously sometimes there are some malware campaigns which have targeted specifically consumer devices, but there's more money in attacking enterprise, so that's generally where they tend to stay. Uh, next is um, script kiddies, or uh, skids, as they're commonly known, and um, these will be similar to cyber criminals, generally trying to make money or like, um, get, like get some sort of fame or, 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 or in the notoriety on the internet. Um, same kind of deal, so like a like SQL mapping uh, T-Mobile, for instance, but uh, the, this group does tend to target consumers a bit more. You've got political activists, and I hope that uh, the, the, the people in this room are safe uh, from them, but that's groups like Anonymous and groups like ISIS who uh, would attack uh, for, um, like, to, like, to um, solve geopolitical objectives or to... Um, or to further their own gains. And, and this can be for money, but it's often for like ideological reasons. Like for instance, um, ISIS have run, have been suspected of running a uh, malware campaign against uh, a uh, group of journalists in Raqqa in Syria. So that, the, that would be an example of what they do. Um, and then we have uh, nation state actors. So you would better hope that we're not um, um, running the, the, uh, or getting the attention of these guys, but generally it's, uh, like, uh, geopolitical objectives and, uh, depending on the nation state, like North Korea, Iran, it can be money, but, um, it's, more, like, more common for it to be, like, for, to, like, further, like, a geopolitical agenda, like we see in, uh, Iran's attack on Saudi's, um, oil, uh, on oil rigs and so on and so forth. Um, so, the uh, the common theme there was that the majority of malware campaigns will target uh, business and enterprise, but like obviously that's not all. Um, and malware campaigns generally do want to make money. And so whenever it comes to stalkerware, and for those who don't know, it's uh, stalkerware is malware which is specifically designed to access somebody's someone specifics um, uh, data and uh, like uh, consumer electronics, whether it's a laptop or whether it's a phone or whether it's whatever. It's just whatever you keep your data on, they'll, they'll generally want to go after. So this is uh, this is kind of new because unauthorized access to personal info is kind of a hard sell in like a large market. If you're just get, if you don't know whose whose information you're getting, or the best they can do is put it into some kind of demographic, it's still not that valuable, or it's certainly not as valuable as like specific like targeting specific people is. 
So um, an example I find uh, outside of Stalkerware has been uh, the sale of installs. So what an install is, is essentially access to an already existing backdoor in someone else's uh, malware campaign, if you could call it that. Uh, so um, like someone will get the initial infection and then sell access to that um, person's computer. Um, and although this is um, used commercially, like for cyber criminals who are looking to make money off exploiting people's computing power or exploiting people's uh, bandwidth, for like um for booters or for uh, harvesting cryptocurrency, uh, it can also be used for um because of the complete access it gives you to someone's machine. It's, it's often used for blackmail or for identity theft and that sort of thing. So uh, this kind of leads to um leads to so like um leads me on the stalkerware. So it tends to run as a stalking as a service model. So it outsources the infection. The, 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 the infection process to the actual client. So the malware, the malware developer generally isn't looking to make money off the data, or if they are, that's kind of a, like a side. That's, that, that's not the main point of the business. The main point is to sell the actual installer to someone who wants to install it on a specific device and then run the command and control server and allow this person to access the, uh, the data they've stolen. So, um, and this is again, like specific targeted information is much more valuable to certain people than uh, generic information, especially when it comes to those they have a, they share a personal relationship with or they are involved with in some sort of institution, whether that be work or school or uh, even, even government and policing. So whenever I talk about specific people, uh, I do have a few examples. Um, we are short on time, so I, I usually ask people to shout some out, but I'll just, I'll give you this one for free. Um, so, so generally, I'll start from left to right. We've got um, a big target for people, for a big target, a big audience for stalkerware developers is, uh, our, um, our, our, our couples, people who have been in a relationship because often, um, there are, uh, unsavory people in, like, in these relationships who do want to have kind of like total control of information or, or whether it's like harassment or intimidation. Like people are interested in having access to their significant other's device without their knowledge. Um, but it also happens in dating. So like whether you're uh, like currently dating someone or whether they're your ex or whether they're even interested in you and you don't know them, they, they, there definitely is an audience for uh, stalkerware in this case too, just because people want to find out like like, like what you're thinking or like, or, or, or what you'd say or like are you interested in them and so on. Um, we've also got big mind mapping organizations like Cambridge Analytica who have realized the power of this personal information and realized the power in like aggregating this kind of data on like a massive scale. So uh, we saw that with Facebook. They don't necessarily use stalkerware, but it is that kind of pervasive surveillance of them taking your personal data and using it to, and using it in a way, in, in a way which, in, whose incentives don't really align with yours. Like they're not really out for your best interest here. Um, and then we've got nation states again. Uh, nation states, I mean, like similar to big mind mapping organizations, um, are, are, are very, very interested in this data and we'll come more to that later. Uh, advertisers for the same reason. And then even in, even if it's meant in a, in a positive way, uh, schools and institutions like that are also interested in this too and will and have, um, tried to, uh, get access to this information. Even if it's like, oh, are they okay at home? Or even if it's something like, are they plagiarizing? Like they're very keen to, uh, to, to find out. Um, so that is the who. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the how and then the why this happens and like what kind of, um, and like how prevalent it is and who is being targeted. Um, so with the how, I took the example of the spy phone, uh, Android Rec Pro. This doesn't work anymore. This isn't an instructional video. This won't work. If you waste 140 pounds on this, I didn't recommend it. That's on you entirely. Um, so you can buy it 140 pounds. I did have the URL up there, but that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So I took it out. Um, so essentially with this piece of malware, stalkerware, um, any access with the unlocked device gives an opportunity for a total compromise. It's, uh, um, again, only on old Androids and all, and all information harvested by this, uh, piece of malware was, uh, you can specify what Gmail you wanted to send to and it will send just, uh, like in incremental logs, uh, like to your, to your inbox, essentially. How convenient. Um, so. It can be installed only with physical access. So it's um, like if someone gets onto your phone, there's the password and turns off the uh, security feature, which uh, blocks unauthorized CDNs. So uh, and Android is a feature which only allows apps to be installed from the uh, from Google authorized um, uh, uh, content delivery networks. But you can turn this off, at least you could on old Androids. And then once you've done that, you, the, you just go to their uh, link. Um, the £140 buys you the installer and a subscription key. And once you enter that and turn the app into hidden mode, it will then disappear off the device as a normal app and appear as a uh, Android service. 
So if you don't know what you're looking for, it's essentially gone. Like if, if, if you're not sure anyone's like looked at your device, like I don't know how many people go in and check their services regularly. And even if you do, like you still might not see it. So that's a, a, a compromise of the device. And it does take with a suitable internet connection. We're talking under a minute here. So like that's again, like if I don't know, I, I carry my phone around with me a lot, but there's definitely been times where it's been out of my sight and or I don't know where it is for a minute or maybe I've left it at my desk and left my room or something like that. So there definitely is like the, this is a feasible attack. So um, the, the, this certain malware gives access to essentially everything that the developer could get his hands on at the time. Uh, so it records all phone calls. It uh, keeps the call log. So you, uh, you can tell who called who, uh, when they called, how long they called for. And uh, it allows you to remotely listen in uh, via the microphone at any time. So um, like, like it essentially turns your phone into a listening device. Uh, every text that you've sent or received, it's still on the phone. Every photo, just uh, well, everything essentially. And, and live GPS location is something we're going to come back to as well. So that's the how, and that's kind of what, and that's kind of what they're getting. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about who, because I, I touched on it briefly, but I only touched on the uh, like the environment, so much you'd find it. I, I didn't really touch on exactly who was doing it. So the first who, um, the main audience, from what I can tell, for stalkerware is um, is people who seek to abuse their partner or someone close to them, who are, or 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 someone who trusts them, and. Uh, 140 pounds to know everything that they because like if I don't know how much you guys use your phone but I certainly use it enough that if someone could listen in to everything about it they would know an awful lot more about me than I'd be comfortable with like a lot of that is private information and uh well like we are seeing quite a lot of this especially um, within the US there has been a few cases in the UK as well where people have been sentenced for it and I mean like not every crime is caught so like I can only imagine how many how many, how many people this is happening to uh, presently, but uh, eighty-five percent of the shelters we surveyed. This is in the um, uh, this is in America. Uh, Seventy shelters around the U.S. Um, Seventy uh, eighty-five percent of the shelters we surveyed said they're working directly with victims whose abusers track them using GPS. So that's again that functionality from that stalkerware. And the, now, now that these percentages aren't just stalkerware. Like it, it can be things like Find My iPhone or like other. Uh, a bit more inconspicuous programs, but like this technology, this capability is being used to hurt vulnerable people. And that is something that is quite like at the core of this talk. And uh, 75% say they're working with victims whose abusers eavesdropped on their conversation remotely. And that's like, it's not so simple to do that. Like, uh, like that, that does require a piece of, to, a piece of technology to enable it. And often that comes in the form of stalkerware. Um, but moving on from that. Um, the, um, divorces, especially now, are increasingly turning to because of the impact that that kind of situation and that like 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 very uh like like very horrible time for everyone involved. Like the stakes of it, people are people are turning to uh, pervasive surveillance solutions to find like um like to find dirt on their partner or to find like a reason that uh, like uh, like either to divorce them or how to how to win the divorce settlement and so on and so forth. So like this does happen in our relationships, regardless of whether it's like just dating or whether it's like something which has been going on a while. Um, outside of personal relationships, it also um, is in our education institutions in Philadelphia. There was a school um, with one thousand eight hundred laptops they give out to their students because I um, I I guess it makes sense uh, because like I I, th I just think schools are f are figuring out that. Kids need a workstation, right? So, um, but what they didn't say is, or what's been alleged is that they, uh, or they, each of the 1,600 laptops had a piece of, um, spyware on it, which allowed the, as it says in the article, indiscriminate use and ability to remotely activate the webcams incorporated into each laptop. Um, so yeah, that's 1,800 students. And it was found out when one of the teachers tried to discipline one of the students for something they'd done at home. So, I mean, like the people doing these kind of campaigns aren't smart, like they're not security, like like researchers, they're not like incredibly like talented people. They're just, you know, people who want to know more, who want to have that kind of control. Um, so we'll go back to the here in a minute. But um, most of these examples, um, uh, the uh, the spy phone was an exception in the sense that it sends the email back to, or it sends the data back in the form of an email. A lot of this data is stored on a server and it is accessible on that server. So. I mean, I imagine most of us are interested in security. I don't really feel like that needs more explanation. I did have a timeline for who um, got breached, but it just changed every time I had to re I had to look at this talk again. So the guys at Motherboard have done a great job of doing that for me. So in the last 18 months, 
Uh, this is Lorenzo FB on Twitter, by the way, him and Joseph F. Cox, who I think is here at the conference today, both do great work on this subject. They've got a fantastic piece of journalism called uh, When Spies Come Home. And it really is a, like, it's, 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 it's a really eye-opening piece. And, and it's over many months and many different topics. And it really is, uh, if you want to know more about this or more about this industry or more about like what people are doing about it, that's, that's definitely the first, the, the first stop for it. But you can see a massive amount of these, uh, spyware companies are getting breached. And like, it's, it's like, it's happening all the time. Cause I imagine that shady organizations which rely on this kind of business model don't really employ the best cyber talent. Cause like, why would you work there when you could work for somewhere that won't, you know, damage your CV irreparably, right? But essentially, it turns pervasive monitoring into massive, massive data loss because, like, people don't even know that this information is leaving their phones. Like, the, this malware is subversive. There's no pop-up to say that, like, they've lost control of this data. Like, it's essentially confidential, unanonymized, private data, which, again, has massive consequences for the person that it's leaking. Uh, for so like uh, blackmail like identity fraud like it becomes a much bigger problem not to downplay the initial problem if that makes sense so back to the who um the good thing about these breaches is it did um tell us that a number of organizations have um have been using these using their work emails i think it was uh so again like the people doing this on very smart and you've got um like organizations like the fbi the uh, ice and the met police um, so what I'd like to highlight here is that these organizations have found in the past to have improper oversight, like, the, like there's not enough, um, control, like, like we were not allowed in many cases, like the MPS refused to investigate when motherboard tried to find out why the metropolitan police were working with these, uh, stalkerware technologies, uh, the MPS refused to investigate it. I think citing national security, but I'm not sure, but like, it's, it's it, like just refused to ask any questions about it. So that's. I mean, it terrifies me. I don't, I don't know it yourselves. But um, and not only do they have this complete lack of like acceptable oversight, but they also have access to vulnerable people, especially in terms of like ICE and the Metropolitan Police. And there would be ample opportunity for these people to, armed with these technologies and these like pieces of malware that they don't have to maintain themselves, like there's plenty of opportunity for them to install these on the phones of, of, of victims or people who are going through the justice system or people who are, are going through immigration and things like that. And that's just like a real recipe for disaster because they're very vulnerable people at very vulnerable times in their lives who might not have any recourse legally. And certainly, um, it, like if, like if they're going through a tough time, you can't really expect them to pull out like an Android reversing book and figure out how to check whether their phone's been tampered with. It's just not feasible. So in summary, uh, the times are changing and the, the, the people who seek to abuse those around them are going to change with them and they're going to find new methods. They're going to find the easiest route to what they want, uh, which is to intimidate and which is to like, uh, take advantage of trust and which is to be like abuse information like this. And one thing I've noticed in researching about this is that vulnerable people are, con are continuing to be left behind by the law and by software providers. So less so it's, um, it's becoming increasingly less so the protections by, made by uh, the people who provide the platforms, just like Apple and Google, are improving for phones, for affordable phones as well. So that's good, but I still don't think it's enough. Um, so it's, it's all well and good for me to tell you that this sucks and, the, and that it's going to continue happening, but what can we actually do? So I don't think that there, the, there's an easy answer. We're not, we're not going to make people not want to do this. That's kind of, I mean, I've, it's, a, it's a sad fact of life, but I don't think, uh, I don't think we've got the power of persuasion to do that. And we could make it illegal. But um, under the uh, Investigator, Investigatory Regulatory Powers Act, it's illegal to wiretap uh, electronic communications without a warrant anyway, so that's not stopping anyone. The law is in a more grey area when it comes to devices you own. So for um, households and indeed institutions where the um, people at the top or the people or like certain people own all the electronics or certain people own handhelds and laptops that other people are going to use, it does become a bit more gray when you're wiretapping your own device that someone else is using. Um, so yeah, that's, um, it's, 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 it's not as clear cut as you might think. So I think the place to start for protecting these people who are, who are victims to this, essentially victims of abuse, children and people in the, people in the workplace is, um, in, in, like essentially increasing funding for local police uh, cybercrime units. If we can get support for these people, if we can give them like somewhere to go with these problems. And, and potentially offer them a solution, then like, like we could maybe see this like being addressed, but, uh, we'll see. And people's baseline, I mean, I'm sure we're all aware 
the baseline knowledge of security for the general public is very, very low, especially when it comes to cases like this. So I feel like security awareness campaigns about uh, knowing what's on your phone, um, like so have, having secure passwords that nobody else knows, keeping your phone updated regularly, like like ch- like not having it in a hostile environment where this might happen would uh, would also be really important. But on the other end, I mean, like we like we can't really put the onus on the victims for all of this. So um, companies currently. Uh, there's a lot of companies that produce this kind of spyware, like, like, like Vervada, which still operate in the UK. You can look them up. I think they do insider threat or something now. But, um, they, uh, they essentially make these pieces of software, which they, I don't want to say intent, but they have no mitigations in it being used, uh, on, unlawfully. So they say, please don't use it on anyone else's, um, computer. And then they have ads like that. Many spouses cheat. They all use cell phones. Like that's not really an implication more than there's a statement, right? So and then disclaimers like, like this drivel, you know, uh, the law generally requires you to notify owners of devices on which you intend to install the licensed software. And then they also have blog posts and promotionals that say this. And that's the same company who both those things. It's not a coherent message. In fact, it's, it's like essentially the minimum they can get away with. Like they know who they're marketing to. They know who they're selling to. They know how their product's going to be used. And there are absolutely no mitigations to stop it being used unlawfully. So I think, uh, that's, Kind of lead me to a question. I think that, can someone confirm that slide running link still works? Um, but, uh, should developers of uh, consumer software be held accountable legally if they write software intended for hidden wiretapping without a reasonable attempt at restricting or mitigating unauthorized usage? Because if, um, a lot of these products tend to market themselves as like taking care of your kids or watching what your kids do online, making sure they're safe. But for that, to, for that goal to be achieved, for instance, it doesn't have to be entirely subversive. Like it's um it like it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be like completely hidden. There can be like a pop up that says hi, this is being monitored, or like or this is like a child friendly software or whatever. Like it's not really um impossible to do if it's not entirely subversive. So I just I thought that was an interesting question to put out there because maybe there are there is too much freedom for developers to write things which could be used for bad. But then also, on the other hand, restricting software in, in such a sense is, isn't really, uh, it's, it restricts innovation. There's a whole bunch of freedom problems with it. So I was just wondering what you guys think. Is that slide your thing up or is it working? All oh, right. Okay. There's no reception. We'll just have a think. Please ask a question at the end because there'll be time for it. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for checking. <laughs> uh, oh, hang on. That doesn't. <laughs> We do have two more slides to go, so thank you very much for your. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. No, I mean it, it, it just means I get two, so it's, it's fine by me. So essentially, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll be fast. I'll be fast. So um, one last bleak kind of section for us. I hope some people find it helpful. Um, despite manufacturers' best efforts, you are on your own when it comes to your own security. It is does require a presence of mind for you to um, for you to secure yourself and keep yourself safe from the threats that are out there in your personal life. Uh, so it, it doesn't just stop around uh, companies. Um, so I've just made a quick game plan. This isn't foolproof. I had someone stick their hand up two nights ago and say, um, or a, a couple of nights ago and say, yeah, why would you do any of this when I can just set up a cell tower and inter- intercept the traffic like that? And it's like, it's, I know you can, but it's not really helpful. Um, so keeping your device locked when you're, I'm, I'm sure we're all on Twitter. I'm sure we've all seen people uh, posting photos of just unlocked laptops and phones on trains while, while they go and get like coffee or whatever. Please don't do that. How many people here, uh, their spouse or their, uh, or, or their partner, or whatever, knows their password? So, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, a hundred percent. There's more, but like, no, don't do that. Your password is your password. If you give it to anyone else, it's pointless. Like, it's literally defeats the purpose of having a password. Uh, so, don't do that. Um, set aside the time to update your devices regularly. And I don't mean just update them like when you have time. I mean, literally set aside a block of time for you to go through and make sure your devices are updated. It doesn't have to be every week. It doesn't have to be every month. Just make sure you do it semi-regularly because a lot of these like software and a lot of this malware is targeting like old versions because it's easier. It takes less development time. You don't need to update it and it's cheaper essentially. And if you're unsure, if your phone has existed in a hostile environment like this for some time, please um, factory reset it again. That's not foolproof, and like saying that root kits exist isn't really helpful either. Um, so, and yeah, in the settings of the device again, a lot of uh, a lot of these malwares will try and run as a service. So please understand what's on your own device. Um, so yeah, financial risk isn't the only risk. Consumer spyware isn't difficult to make. 
but a well read, they're well read in your life essentially. Be conscious of how much info is just on your phone, like eggs, basket. So, and be conscious of best security practice in your personal life. I imagine we do a lot of stuff with our personal security that we wouldn't do in the office because it would get us in trouble. So, that's so there's a reason that's the law in the office. So, uh, follow me on Twitter as well. Thank you very much, guys. Awesome, thank you. I have one question already. Uh, you mentioned mostly Android, iPhone as well? Uh, I didn't look into iPhone, and from what I understand, um, there's a man in the front row there who's very keen on iOS and Mac security. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, at iOS, iOS tends to be a lot more secure in terms yeah. of um, unauthorized apps and things, and like app isolation especially. So yeah. I, I didn't research into it, but you're generally okay. not entirely safe. Don't jailbreak it, that's a terrible idea. A little bit safer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Any other questions in the audience over here? I will walk to you. One moment. Hmm? Oh, does it work? Yeah. I don't think many people are connected to it. Um, question. Um, are you aware of any apps, you know, for Linuxes like Chat Rootkit and things like that? Are mm -hmm. there apps out there that actually scan your device to um, see if there's anything installed? I, I, cause I, I thought about giving a recommendation, but the amount of apps, especially on the Play Store, which has awful phishing and like malware controls to begin with, um, there's a lot more apps masquerading as like, um, clean up your phone apps, which actually just add junk onto it and there's spyware and, 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 and among themselves. Cause for an app to do that, it would require like root permissions. It would require extended permissions. And I certainly wouldn't recommend that people just search it on the Play Store and download an app. So, but no, I don't have an actual uh, recommendation in terms of Android apps. I should. <laughs> okay, any more? Go around, go around, go around. No? All right. Coffee break. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks,